both lamb and shepherd. You, Lord, are both prince and slave. You, peacemaker and sword bringer of the way you took and gave. You, the everlasting instant, you whom we both scorn and crave. Clothed in light upon the Stripped of might upon the cross, shining in eternal glory, beggared by a soldier's toss, you the everlasting instant, you who are both gift Walk each day beside us, sit in power at God's side. You who preach a way that is narrow, have a love that reaches wide. You the everlasting Pilgrim guide. Worthy is our earthly Jesus. Worthy is our cosmic Christ. Worthy is your defeat and victory. Worthy still your peace and strife, you the everlasting instant, you who are our death and our It's a lovely thing. There are actually more people here than I expected. I was going to preach from down there thinking we'd have a very small number, but here I am up here. And Alex says, it's okay. Our online worship community can still see me. As you look in your bulletin, you see that the, uh, the title that I chose for the homily, which is my way of saying this will be shorter than a sermon, um, is Jesus knows Peter and Peter knows Jesus. But I really could have one more phrase tacked onto the end of that title, and that would be, Jesus really knows Peter and loves him anyway. Peter goes by many names in the scriptures. This is one of the first disciples of the 12 that Jesus will travel and do his ministry with for three years before he dies in Jerusalem and is raised again. So Peter goes by a lot of different names. Simon Peter, Simon, Peter, Cephas. It's kind of like if you are walking around with a name like Elizabeth. You can be Elizabeth, you can be Liz, you can be Beth, you can be Betsy, you can be all kinds of different things, but it's still the same person. So especially in these weeks that are to come, you might see these different names, but we mean the same person, Peter. Before we go any further, I did want to say a word about our three-month series. Four weeks on Peter, this is the first week, then four weeks on Paul, and four weeks on Mary Magdalene. And I've chosen all of the readings for this whole time. Nobody gave them to me. And that also means that I chose that Old Testament reading, which may have you scratching your head, <laughs> especially Nancy, who was reading it. Why does she have this part from Ezra today? I'll tell you why. 
because it reflects the understanding of the riches of the faith community in that Old Testament time. It was the precious metals that was dug out of the earth and made into something that was a commodity, something with riches, silver and gold, literally. When we move into this time of the beginnings of the early church, we see that there's been a huge shift. Literal precious metals in the Old Testament become metaphorical rocks and stones. And the rocks and stones stand for people. People become the riches of the church. People will become what is precious about first the Jesus movement and later the church. And many of those rocks or stones standing together are what make for the strength of that church and the riches of the church. So as Dave read from Peter's first letter, like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The rocky metaphor extends to Jesus too, right? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, lifted from Psalm 118. Yet, because Jesus knows that his earthly time is limited, he will be killed at age 33, he knows that the message about the kingdom of God, what is that message? The existence of justice, grace, and mercy is what is God's intended state of being. That message had to be entrusted to many others in order that that good news might be shared. And so, in this gospel, according to Matthew, Jesus begins at the Sea of Galilee, and there's a suddenness to this whole story of choosing these first disciples, of which Peter is the first. It's kind of like if you are a believer in love at first sight. Who's a believer in love at first sight here? Yeah? Love at first sight. This kind of really quick, I just knew, I looked into your eyes and I suddenly knew one of my favorite songs. It could also be like if you've ever gone to the Humane Society to get a new pet and you hold that pet in your arms for the first time and you just know this is family in an instant. I wonder if that's the kind of dynamic that was going here, that Jesus just knew that Peter and James and John and Andrew were the ones to accompany him on this amazing journey that they were about to have. Did he? It could have been also, though, that fishing had become really difficult at that time around the Sea of Galilee. It was harder to make a living. The Roman occupiers were starting to take over the industry, and it was harder for them to put food on the table from being fishers. So maybe there was something of a motivation away from what they were doing, but certainly there was a great draw toward Jesus, toward this man. And maybe they also looked at Jesus, and they just knew. So we go from the banks of the Sea of Galilee and flash forward, like I said, 12 chapters. And what's happened in the meantime? Jesus has gone about healing people, feeding thousands of people, and doing amazing teaching on what is this kingdom of heaven to be like. And Jesus asks them then at Caesarea Philippi, with all the disciples gathered, who are people saying I am? And the first group of them say, well, John the Baptist, some, you know, some other prophet from of old reincarnated and here among us again. And then he drills down once again, but who do you say that I am? And here comes Peter with this profound proclamation. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And to have made that pronouncement in that space for Jesus meant everything. And so that's when Jesus says, on this rock, Peter, Petros, you, I'm going to build my church, and the keys to the kingdom of heaven will be yours. It's a heady and a triumphant moment. 
And yet, not 12 chapters later, but only a few sentences later, the next few verses, Jesus reveals what the overall plan is going to be, and it's that he's going to go to Jerusalem, and that he will be killed, and that he will rise again. And what does Peter say in response? Nope. He gives Jesus a big old nope. That is not going to happen. God forbid it, Lord. This must not happen to you. I don't agree with that plan. Nope. You cannot leave us in this way. And then Jesus uses another name for Peter. And what is that name? Satan. Not a great name. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. Your mind is on human things and not divine things. Yeah. So this person, this Peter, that Jesus said just a little while ago, I'm building my church on you, then says, you are a hindrance to me. Your mind is on human things and not divine things. And that's why I say, Jesus really knows Peter. He knows that Peter is going to continue to be both a gift and trouble. He's trouble. We'll find out more about that in the weeks to come. Peter is messy and unreliable, wrong-headed, and again, as we'll see in upcoming weeks, he's impulsive and brazen and even more. Yet Jesus does not take back those keys to the kingdom. He does not renege on building the church on Peter. And that, my friends, is actually where there's good news for you and for me this morning. We often give God the big old nope, don't we? We bring our doubts and our denials. And there's something greater at work in your life. So I challenge you in the next week, the next walk you take, whenever you have a little time alone to ponder, how would you think about the version of your life, your life with Jesus, that resembles Peter's? Have you had a, a suddenly new moment? Have you had a nope moment? Do you go back and forth between the two? I wear the literal keys to this church around my neck. And those of you who have been around me long enough know that I often lose these keys and need help finding them. I also routinely doubt and deny what God is up to in this place. I do. And I am ever surprised by the glory of God in people unlikely people that I get to witness and know and grow to love here at Redeemer. So just this last week, we were in the final days of this online campaign, $26,000 to help build a new kitchen on this level of the church. 26,000. That's not a small number. And what we were doing is we were asking online for people who weren't already a part of this church to give some of their money toward this effort. Now, you didn't know this until I told you now, but I knew that there was a grant that was due to come through in the amount of $14,000. And I thought, well, with that, maybe we can get the extra $12,000 and we'll finish that campaign on goal. Well, days and weeks went by and I kept pestering the grantor, when are we going to find out? And she said, we're just waiting for one more thing, waiting for one more thing, and the days were running out. And so we had to go all in and just push and ask for people from the community, maybe who don't even know us, but who could understand our mission of feeding whoever is hungry at noon, six days a week. And the $26,000 was surpassed without that grant at all. <laughs> it's amazing. 
And that's why I always say that God's blessing do not depend on your degree of faith. God has blessed me over and over again at the times when I am weakest and feeling most in doubt. God just keeps showing up and showing off over and over again. So here's the thing about Peter that you'll notice as we go through the next week, and especially if you take some extra time to read or listen to an audio version of one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And oops, maybe also Acts. Peter is there, and he cares, and he dares. He's there, he cares, and he dares. And in that way, he makes sense as one to carry forward what Jesus Christ came to do. The abiding presence of Christ in the bread and wine that we've already consumed this day. That's Jesus there. The level of care that Jesus has for each and every lost sheep, each one of us, and the dare that Jesus had to face execution with the faith that resurrection was on the other side. Wow. Precious stones. Precious stones. We have our cracks, and we have a master builder who knows better than we do what this church is to be about. Let's not pray for perfection, but to be those who are there, caring and daring to be one with Christ, who knows us at our core and loves us anyway. Amen. So this is the awkwardest part. See, Jeff would have been